Hello, beautiful human. Uh, I am Zach. That is Dana. Yep. Welcome to the studio. Uh, this is crazy. You're incredible. Uh, Labyrinth is here. Yes. I appreciate you. Uh, like, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. <laughs> really? You? It, so, is it weird to... How do you carry the title of one of the greatest artists to come out of the UK of this generation? Because that is a title that is bestowed upon you and is... Oh, wow. It, it comes up every time you come up in conversation. You have to be somewhat aware of that, right? Or do you block it out? Um, I I just literally... I'm, I don't even... I don't hear what people are saying because I don't really... I'm raising my children and making music, honestly. So I don't know what anyone's saying. I just like... I feel like at one moment I arrived at what I wanted to do and it seems like somebody gets it. Maybe one... <laughs> <laughs> a, a person more than one, I guess. <laughs> when do you think yeah. people started getting it? Um... Uh, I don't even know. I think I think um, I think over time there's been so many different records. I remember, of course, doing my first few uh, records with uh, Tiny Tempo, who was he, like a UK artist, he, and I did Pass Out and Frisky and Goosebumps and all of these earlier records. And people kind of loved what I was doing then. And then it kind of moved on to like Let the Sunshine, Earthquake, and then it moved on to, I guess, Jealous. And Jealous was a big record, especially in America for Huge. me, where I kind of thought, honestly speaking, thought my career was over um, because I was just like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And I think it was, I think I saw, some, like it was like a massive artist and it was like, Jealous is my record. And I was like, what? And it was like, I, this record is powerful. And then I just saw people performing it on every television show you can imagine and i was like oh shit like this record is is uh bigger than me you know and and that kind of it kind of gave me some more energy to want to write again and get out there well, so validation from your peers helped you keep going it wasn't even the validation from peers it was just that um the record at the time when i released it in the uk um a lot of people just like the, the radio i remember i kind of shared this record with the radio and they were like yeah man that was cool a bit dreary okay let's move on to happy hour and i was like oh shit this record <laughs> i was like do you know how much energy and time i put in this record but i was like this is how it goes sometimes and then um i just didn't know that the record was as powerful as it was and then when i saw the way people received this one record it was like it kind of made me understand that i gotta keep going because i don't know what my music's gonna do uh, like in terms of internationally um, and I don't know uh, if it I, I didn't see how powerful it was then I didn't I didn't have that confidence so I was just like man um, I guess I've had my journey let's just leave it at jealous and then yeah it was just kind of like it sparked a thing where it was like do you know what keep going that song resonating in the way that it does uh, what does it prove to you like, what does it prove, and what do you carry with you that you put into Jealous that ends up showing itself in the art that you create moving forward? Um, for me, it was that I wrote something I really loved that was uh, something that was really close to me, um, and that um, even harmonically, like, I wrote the arrangements, I wrote, like, uh, the whole, th like, the, I put, like, a lot of, kind of, um, of my soul into the record, and I know in this industry that, that that isn't always the case where you can put yourself into what you're doing. It doesn't mean you're going to end up with success. That's just how it goes, you know, because we're in an entertainment industry and anything can be entertaining. <laughs> so for me, I was like, um, it kind of just gave me confirmation that even if your record is for one person, it was for a reason, if you get what I mean. And so for me, I was like, that's what kept me going because... I think my focus was on validation from a mass amount of people and from having a hit record. But writing a record that's just one person, like it, it does something to them and it spurs them on to do something else is as powerful as writing it for a million people that like, uh, you know, that like uh, that, that love it for one minute, you know. Were you writing that record from your own reality or was it, were you acquiring yeah. stories from others? What was it? I started the record with... Uh, Josh Keir and Natalie Hemp and I was writing in Nashville and 
my uh um kind of um the plan was to go and write a real song that's literally what i was thinking at the time i was like well you know i'm in my studio with all these uh simps and soft simps and my computer let me go to nashville where people actually write songs and when i went there there were people sitting in houses there was guitars there was no computers it was literally just here's a piano we're gonna write a song from top to bottom and we'd play the whole song on our phones and then you would leave with a song and i was like this is sick i love that like that's like old school traditional songwriting um and i'm a big fan of that so I, I, I kind of wanted that experience and Jealous came out of that experience. I worked with really amazing writers over there. And um, uh, Jealous at the time when we wrote it, um, I I was just like, okay, this is one of the songs of the batch. And then when I kind of really connected with the record, I was like, this is about my dad. Like, this is about my dad leaving my family. And uh, it was the um, it was the viewpoint of, my mom, my whole family writing to my dad and saying, like, I'm jealous of you not being here, if you get what I mean. Um, and so when we put out the record, I was like, I, I feel like I did the right thing. I wrote something that was that came from a place in me. Here you go, guys. And it was like, yeah, man, cool, man. <laughs> 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 and, um, and I, I'm not bitter about it. It was just kind of like, that. that's the reality of the industry. You can write whatever you want. You can put whatever you want, whatever source you want into your stew. It doesn't mean that, the whole world's going to eat it. But one thing I realised from Jealous was the way it connected with people um, uh, became, it was like, oh, this is what it's about. And and do you know what funny story as well is I met Billy not too long ago. I, I, of course, you know, I did the record with Billy. Yeah. We did Never Felt So Alone. And sh- that was the first record she mentioned to me. She was like, Jealous was my shit. And I was like, really? And she was like, like Jealous really hit me. And that's one of my favourite records. So I was like, it's so weird that this record that I thought was not important, nobody cared about it, has been a record that's really kind of hit home for so many people. And um, it kept me going, but it also kept so many other people going. So I was like, I, I have to realign what I'm here for, you know, and what I want to write for, you know? And you can hear that in the music you make moving forward. Yeah, 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 100%. It's yeah, like yeah. really... Yeah. That was, the, that was the moment, honestly. That was the moment where it was like, okay... Let's go and do this for real. Um, and I, when the album I was writing uh, had a lot of, some of it started with some of the Euphoria music. So like, let's say Mount Everest, uh, All For Us, those were records that were written on this album that was heading up to Euphoria. Um, and at the time, Sam Levinson, who done, who directed uh, um, and wrote uh, Euphoria, yeah. um, heard these records and was like, bro, you got to compose for this show. And I thought, I didn't know what it was. And then it turns out that all of these records that I decided to change my perspective on and was like, I'm going to write just because I feel like this is what my my gut wants to say, uh, ended up on this show. And and then, of course, you years later, I end up performing them at Coachella and people yeah. are losing their shit to it. I'm like, what the hell is this, you know? Are you usually making records and not realizing what they're about from your reality until after they're done? Or do you know while you're making it or go in planning to tell a story? Um, sometimes it's that. Do you know it's weird? Because when you write from a place where you you black out, like so there's a moment where I remember hearing, uh, what's his name? Um, you talk about ja- Chris Martin? Who are you talking about? Oh, I was talking about Jack White. Okay, so. Um, who's an incredible artist and has inspired me to want to play an instrument. Um, and he was saying... When you truly are writing in the studio and you, you, uh, a true moment when you're really expressing art is when you almost don't feel like you're writing the record. So it feels like an other entity is writing through you. And I've had that moment many times where it's almost like you're not thinking anymore. You're just feeling the music. You're just literally like these notes are coming to you. These words are coming to you. And then you step back and you're watching yourself write the song. And then there's a moment where... You get to view the record and you're like, man, my soul was trying to say something to me. Or like, and and that's happened to me many times where I've listened to a record much later on. And I'd be like, this is crazy. Like this, this was a message to me like ages ago, you know? Can um, you yeah. ho- like home in, like home in that muscle? Like, is that something that you can like kind of focus or are yeah. there moments where your soul doesn't connect to whatever is higher above and yeah. uh, something doesn't happen? 
Um, I think it's more about um your where you are like in your um in terms of like how much you can let go. So a lot of it is like um how would I explain? Um, I guess let's if we're looking at it like from a spiritual point of view, and anyone that's religious knows this is like if you go to church with your problems and you go to your religious place with your problems on your mind, you're not actually going to connect with God. And so it's the same way with music, is if you go into the studio focused on how do I sell this record or um, how do I become more famous or is this going to be my biggest record ever, you're actually not focused on transmitting this energy that like is touching your own your heart or touching your soul, you know? So for me, it's like how do I remove all of the mess or all, all of the peripheral kind of influence out of this experience and just make it about connecting this with this energy that I'm about to kind of transmit, if you get me. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. So can, so that's how I get there. It's like... Are you always there? Em- empty your cup. Every time you go in the studio, empty the cup. It's not about anything but the moment. That's... Because a lot of people, like, they go in, or artists, they think they yeah. need to go in with a plan or go in with lines or, yeah. you know, it's more of a, contri- a contrived strategy. Yeah. As opposed to it being a spiritual thing. Yeah. For me, music's always spiritual, and it's kind of like, um, I guess if you go in the studio with a contrived thought, that means you don't trust the process. Kind of like, same like religion. If you, go, if you go to church or you go to whatever religious establishment you go to with no trust, then you basically don't trust the thing that you're supposed to have faith in. So the same way with music, if I go in a room and I'm like, oh, I, I need this and let me use this loop from that guy or let me borrow that guy's thing, that means you have no trust in your ability to to dial in on something that that's going to matter you know so for me i'm kind of on a mission of how do i how do i truly write what my like what's meant to come through me and if if i can't do that then i don't really want to write music i have no reason to be a part of this industry are you, are you alone when you're doing this um it it can be with a person i remember i was with <laughs> i'm like it sounds like i'm name dropping um but i was with zendaya and she was like, Lab, you're weird. And she was sitting <laughs> in the studio with me. And I look crazy in the studio. Sia said the same thing. She was like, when I'm sitting in the studio with you, it looks like you're talking to these people in the sky. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, that bass line. And yeah, 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 okay, keys. And and, and it's it kind of like, it's like I'm having an out-of-body experience. So I look really weird and I sound really weird because I'll be singing melodies while figuring out chords, while like mapping out this idea for this song. Um, um, but that's how it I kind of gets dialed in. It feels like a, like I just I'm not in the room, and and whoever's in the room, usually they're just like you're a weirdo. But what I'm hearing sounds <laughs> <laughs> sounds like maybe it's worth the, <laughs> worth the time. <laughs> Are you starting with production and then bringing lyrics and story to it, or it's any uh, from any direction? Really? It will be um, a lyric can start a song, um, like a. Like, okay, so like this light, yeah? It's on. It's burning forever for us. That's a song. Like, it's like, like imagine if the light is an, is a, an, like an actual person. If it had to sit there all day just trying to support us and to support our moments and we don't realize it's there, that's a song to me, if you get I me. Mean. And, and if I sung that song from that perspective, there's a whole record in that, to me, anyway. So that's how I would see songs in the like smallest thing really <laughs> in the dumbest thing yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then you you build a story out of that yeah sometimes i would build a story of that sometimes i'll build a story out of an energy i caught from someone like if somebody's well both sitting in the room and i don't know like you're protecting yourself uh from me and protecting your energy from me because you're nervous that's the song as well it's like i'm too scared to be to be vulnerable and then all of a sudden there's a song out of that so i feel like I remember like Martin Scorsese saying it like uh, I was watching his masterclass on um, on my phone and he was saying that there's a story in everything that exists around us and you just have to have the eye to see it. So to me, there's literally stories in everything. By the way, Ends and Begins yeah. is the album. Yep. Is this a collection of stories or is this one cohesive story from top to bottom? Um, the story, the main story is me and my my missus like and. Um, I took moments out of, 
our relationship and um I kind of wanted to zoom in on different areas of our relationship and kind of tell like a like a story that's not it's not like um what's the word um it's not literal but it's just moments that inspired these different songs um and then uh yeah just t- like kind of the journey of the album sonically and uh musically is that that experience is uh, are you and it's crafted the exact same way yeah but do you realize in the moment what you're writing about or does it only present later no no with this record i was like i i was literally just writing uh based on things that happened between us like my missus has been like a a massive part of the reason why I'm here as well. Like when I, before Jealous, when I was going through a difficult time mentally, um, she introduced me to like people, uh, like life coaches, um, like people that just were really powerful for the mental health side of things. And I, at the time I had a team that was, um, that was just wasn't great for my mental health. It wasn't their fault. It was just that they, they, they didn't even know about that. They weren't, they weren't trying to support that side of me as an artist they were very focused on success and moving forward, even at my detriment. And she realized that very early. And um, yeah, I wrote about that in the record. I wrote about a lot of those things. So a lot of stuff that you've been holding with you. This is yeah. about a longer journey of love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally, literally. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And so I kind of wanted to make the record about, um, I, I, in my head, I imagined us as like a, um, like a, a kind of um, Bonnie and Clyde on this journey through through this like um, uh, fantasy world. And so I just was like, okay, every lyric, every melody, every sound is going to be focused on that energy. And are, when do you start making songs for this album? Like, yeah. How long ago? Ages ago. Honestly, I started writing for, I, I have more, that this album has way more songs attached to it than, than what was put on the album. I think there's like at least 90 records and I cut it down to 10. Wow. <laughs> it was mad, bro. How many years did it take you to really um, complete it? Um, it took me a year to do the actual album, like to to, to kind of get the records together. Um, and then in terms of us planning to release it, it took, uh, it took a few years because just planning, like it was just kind of like I wanted to find the right time to release the record. Um, and it felt like later was better. So... Th- you you have ninety and then you cut down to ten. What will you do with the other eighty? They'll go on movies. Yeah. Or I'll um they'll go on other albums, just depending. Like or, or like maybe other artists. There's a yeah. There's been a few artists that have called me in like lab. I've been calling you for a year now. Do you want to do something? <laughs> and now they hear this, they're gonna be like, you got ninety other oh uh, well, like I don't know eighty other songs that you should be. <laughs> <laughs> pass them this yeah, way yeah, yeah. <laughs> and are you okay with doing that yeah yeah i think that's that's the way to do it man it's fun yeah mm. yeah whatever wherever music needs to go it will go you know but how do you know if something's meant for you and meant or, or meant for somebody else or meant for i mean i'm assuming lsd has done the three of you collectively right? yeah, yeah but sometimes we use records that were like like wes will play me a record and he'll be like i love this record i think it could be for lsd and then we'll just do it or see I will have a song. You know what I mean? So huh. we all just mix records or um, um, sometimes we'll write specifically for the group. With the last album, we wrote sp- specifically for that project. But um, uh, yeah, it can work either way. It's like it may, like maybe one of the greatest projects I've ever fucking put so into fun. my ears. It was so fun. It is sonically so extraordinary. Oh man, that's 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 incredible for you to, to for me to hear you say that because I was just like we're just having fun. <laughs> but in everything yeah. that you do, I mean, you specifically, I, I do believe this is the case for a lot of incredible artists. But there's so much nuance and little tiny details that make up the genius and the art that you put out there in the world, and that is like that. It is so evident in LSD, but also like knowing Sia, she's been on the show a few times. Oh, okay, nice. No. 
Yeah. She, she, like, her rule in life is she doesn't release an album unless every song could be a single. Yep, that's how. <laughs> She's a she fucking really, genius. She kills me. She's crazy. I uh, know, and she really is that. <laughs> but she also, I believe, yeah. she's one of the people who have told a story similar to what you were saying in terms of how she, like, Chris Martin's come on and, talk, yeah. and talked about how he connects to a higher power. Yeah. And, like, the universe is what like feeds his him his, his music. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah it, it is kind of similar to what you were saying in terms yeah. of connecting to something talking with something, collaborating yeah. with something that's larger than just you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... Yeah, that's what me and Sia call it. She calls it the spirit internet. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that was like, she's the best. <laughs> she was like, lab, are you going into the spirit internet again? I'm like, yes, yeah, I'm going to go on <laughs> spiritual Google. Do being, <laughs> being in a room with her or Wes, like, doesn't that, does that make you a better artist? What's that? To be able to do like, that? Working oh. with them. Like, do you become a better artist from that? Yeah, I think you just... Uh, I think, like, uh, uh, with... LSD, I learned a lot from Wes sonically. And funny enough, I I was working on LSD before I did Euphoria. And when I heard Wes's production, it inspired me to upgrade on what I was doing. So I was like, oh, you know what? His kicks and his snares and his just the separation, his records sound so sick. I need to go home and, and start working on my shit. And then it it kind of almost prepared me for the next thing. And, and I, I worked with Sierra on some of her movies and ideas and records and those things enhanced the way i started writing or approach things so i feel like all of those collaborations are for a reason you know yeah that's like yeah that's a sign of a good team you yeah, know? yeah yeah it's a vibe but the thing is i didn't know i was gonna learn from them when i did work with them so that was like i feel like i feel like we cross each other's paths for a reason you know yeah the universe needed it to happen yeah i feel like the same thing with you and tiny tempo like yeah, <laughs> you guys came into your lives at really vital moments that yeah. end up changing the trajectory for each of you. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, when we started, uh, well, I was working with a lot of artists, and at the time, um, me and my manager at the time, we were, um, we were like, I want to make grime music. I was like, I'm going to make grime music, but I don't want it to be traditional because what we found is that a lot of American-based music came over to the UK. And was killing it. Like literally you would see the club go crazy when Little Wayne or someone was on. Like someone from the States was on. And then as soon as like our own urban music came on, it was like the floor was just dead. It was you see like maybe five guys trying to fight each other. <laughs> and then we were like, yo, <laughs> like what if we could make UK music bring everyone to the flipping middle of the dance floor? And so I was like, okay, let's mess around with it. And and I wanted to use like drum and bass, dance, like everything that was dance in in the UK, or like put it on a record, you know. And you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it worked. Yeah, yeah. And it was way, crazy. Tiny Tempa ends up breaking here in the states too, and has a whole. Oh, ride. I didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, he came on our show, didn't he? Oh yeah. yeah oh really? Oh, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, yeah we, I, I we've been doing that. this for far too long. That's uh, crazy. <laughs> no, but he's fucking incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was wild. That was wild. Such but, a yeah. gift. Yeah, man. It was. Um, um, that was a good moment. I, I had a lot of fun then collaborations yeah. end up becoming something that i don't know like you, you knowledge yes but also giving two incredibly gifted people together on one record you end up like merging worlds and universes like you could never have imagined and yeah. it's like that it's evident in so much of what you do i mean obviously with zendaya obviously with bill but yeah. i didn't know you worked with connie west i didn't know you had two yeah. records at the weekend yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. when, when yeah. you're working with abel are you sending him things or are you no. actually with him no i was in the studio especially for i remember funny enough the record i gave him for beauty behind the madness was a record i was going to do on the record that came out after euphoria <laughs> and um i just didn't know where to take the record and he heard it and uh he was he just put his hand up in the air like this and i was like this is your record i was like it's this is not for me i'm not taking it anywhere um and yeah was that a song that was, was supposed about, to be on imagination and the misfit uh, yeah Kid? yeah yeah literally that was the song that was going to be on it and then i was just like he he felt it and he he knew what he wanted to do with it and i was like i'm i'm just this one's just sitting in the sitting in a room and um yeah he just he just took it to where it needed to go so i was like great it, need, it found its home and i can make the case that he himself fits the message of imagination and the misfit kid yeah right? yeah yeah, like he, yeah he fits that, that bill yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. Definitely. <laughs> That's a fucking one of my favorite albums of all time. Oh, respect, bro, man. Yeah, yeah we had a, and I, I was in the studio with him while I was making that record as well. And 
um, I just learned a lot of stuff. Like he, he was very focused. And at the time, I didn't know I had ADHD and I also was very much not focused. Um, I was all over the shop. I would make a million ideas, never finish any of them. And I saw him in the studio and he was just zoned in. And there was 10 guys in each studio room and he was going into each room, checking out the records, writing on each record. And I was just like, that's just crazy. This guy's just running his world. And that's the reason why it's so cohesive and so on point. And and just me seeing that was like a great learning curve, um, and seeing his like, it was like, like intense focus. Like I'm heading this way, and then you saw it, you know. And and I literally saw, uh, I think it was Starboy just go crazy, and I was in the room while that shit was going crazy, and I was like, that's wild. Like to have that kind of confidence and focus going on, you know. Do you take that and maybe instill it a little bit into your own practice? Yeah, like for me it was. I don't. I, it wasn't even instilling it because you can't. You can't Learn just it. take it. Yeah, you can't. You have to understand it, and and that's what happens with a lot of artists in this industry. Is they they're like, oh, the weekend's focused. Like, um, that was just given to him, and it was like, no, this guy learned by failing over and over again. And he was like, oh man, I flopped that record. I didn't focus enough or whatever. And you learn by kind of uh, things not working out. And so for me, I learned to, about focus by going. Uh, I did it the last time and so much peripheral noise got in the way of this process. How do I how do I stop that from happening? And that was only by it happening over and over again, you know? Do, do you do you manage your ADHD better now? Yeah, I started taking medication for it. It really made a difference. I, I it dramatically it made a difference, honestly. It changes your life, right? I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of the things that I could do now without taking the medication. Do you, like... How hard is it to score a movie when you suffer from ADHD? Bro, or a TV I don't know show. how I did the first season of Euphoria. <laughs> it was a mess. Like, in my studio, luckily I was delivering, and, and thanks with the help of Sam, he was he wanted to do things differently, and if he was a traditional director, I don't think we would have... I don't think it would have worked the way it worked, but he was... He kind of was like, I know you've never composed it for a film before, a TV show, so... Um, and uh, but I know you can do it and so he was just like he kind of just um, trusted me a lot but then also uh, when where there was difficulties he would kind of he, he knew how to be like lab just give me this I'm gonna uh, I, I know exactly where I'm, I want to put this in the show and so because he was so uh, clear on what he wanted to get he it made it much easier you know how does that even work does he just send you episodes with no music and you write to the episode um he sent me so there's this thing called temp score and so his temp score was insane like he was playing me music i had never heard because i grew up in church with my family and we weren't allowed to listen to secular music so i heard i heard like i don't know like prince when i was like 12 or like like if you get what i mean like yeah. mm -hmm. much later was that the first song like was that like, the first artist you ever heard that was like the first album because my uncle played me prince and then um i bought purple rain <laughs> And like there was loads of kids. I don't even think I was twelve. I think I was much older. But there was loads of kids that was just like, yeah, that's old stuff. Like, like my cousin played me that ages ago. And then I would, I'm playing this record like it's fresh for me. David <laughs> Bowie, all these guys like it's. The, and I was like, this record is sick. Going up to people telling them it's sick, and they're like, yeah, that, that kind of <laughs> happened. <laughs> um, and so for me, like music has been super fresh for me. And so when Sam played me some of the temp score stuff, this was like old 90s stuff, all like, uh, like old bands, T-Rex, everyone, and all these guys that I just didn't know. And then when I listened, I was just like, yo, I better deliver because this stuff is just mind-blowing. And so it really inspired how much I wanted to go in because what I was sonically hearing was just blowing my mind. So I was like, okay, if it doesn't sound at least good enough or better, then I don't want to do this. Like, <laughs> Did you think you're going to be able to craft hit records off of this song? Or the, this show, I'm off, sorry? Off the show. Do you know what? Um, I I always write like this, so I didn't really think about... I just was like, I just want to write what I think is good. Like, And so when I heard the... If I heard something that I didn't think was cool, I was like, okay, I'm going to write something that I think would suit the scene because I want to make the scene... One thing I, both me and Sam spoke about is like, I didn't like when people make TV shows and they make like dreary, boring music behind it because I was like, I want it to feel like uh, 
the way I feel when I hear music in a movie. Like if I'm watching a Tarantino movie, the music's so next level. It makes you like, this scene feels even more special, you know? And that's the way I um, am drawn towards music in movies. It's like, uh, I don't know, like uh, Gladiator was another one for me. The music was so incredible that I was, it was inspiring when I was just watching this film. And so I was like, if people don't feel that way when they're watching this, then I don't want to do it. Like I want it to feel like it enhances the scene. And, and that's the, the feedback I got, uh, after we put out the show. So I was like, that's that's wonderful, you know? And you really do it in a way that, like, is kind of atypical for TV shows. You use lyrics very heavily in the scoring in a way yeah. that, like, isn't usually done. Yeah, 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 totally, yes. It's like yeah. I, you tell real stories while also enhancing the current story that's being told while but, giving new yeah. perspective to the characters. Yeah. It's a bunch of but layers. But that's just, like, what you were saying. Like, so Still Don't Know My Name, uh, the cat uh, character, um... Uh, Barbie's character um, I literally was seeing her go through her story and I started writing Still Don't Know My Name because she was on the internet she was like this god and then in school nobody cared about her mm -hmm. so that literally inspired Still Don't Know My Name so like that's how a lot of the records on the, the, the show were written it was just like these little moments just like what I'm talking to you about with the lights or with you know like with me seeing objects it would be like that. It would be like, oh, that feels like that, you know? Is that emotionally taxing, carrying and kind of dissecting the stories behind characters or even a lamp? Um, I guess with ADHD, yeah, because you're thinking too much. <laughs> it's like, do you want to think in that many layers? Um, but, but part um, of you wants to think in that many layers because that gives you a good story to tell, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I'm just, yeah, I'm just always collecting because it's, I guess... Another part of ADHD is is stimulus, isn't it? Yeah. So so uh, I guess um, it creates dopamine for me to 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 learn new things or to study something new. Um, so that just that's something that always stimulates me. Is like there's always a story. There's yeah. always like I can write music to just any moment happening right now. You really did research and and chose to really understand ADHD in a way that like a lot of people don't. And that's pretty yeah. cool because it yeah. is true. Like learning yeah. new things and taking on new challenges creates dopamine. So it's why you want to keep going to the next. That's exactly it. But that's that was the same thing for me. I think the reason why I learned about ADHD, started learning about ADHD anyway, was because I'm I have kids, and I wanted to. I didn't want to be a hindrance to their growth, and um, I was like, okay, I want to make sure that I'm. Uh, another part of ADHD is flipping out or like having like outbursts or becoming agitated High and emotional. I was like I wanted to to be I wanted to find a way of just balancing myself and I was like maybe I do have this because a lot of people kept saying you there's something going on in there um and so I was like okay I'm gonna go check it out and when I once I have uh, kind of done the tests I was like okay this is once you learn about something that affects your mental health or affects you just in general and um, it becomes a sword instead of a hindrance yeah. and so for me i'm like if i i, I want to find the superpower and i want to find the things that get in the way of my life and that was one of the big ones for me and you were able to do, did you have any fear that managing it would jeopardize the creative side of you because there is like yeah. you know just speaking yeah. personally from it yeah. like a part of me is like oh maybe that's what makes me great that's yes, a part yeah, of yeah. the secret fucking sauce yeah, yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> um for me, um, I I felt like I wasn't able to run a business. So let's I'll give you an example. I was working on uh, the Coachella show that I was uh, that we put on recently, and there were so many moving parts that if I was if I didn't have medication, I would have just uh, dis disassociated myself with everything and just wanted to curl under a cover and just not talk to anyone because it would have been overstimulating, mm. and so. Um, I wanted to be able to manage what's going on in my career. And I found that before Imagination and the Misfit Kid, I went into deep depression because I was in these loops of writing so much music and never been able to, I would come up with these crazy ideas, but never be able to finish them. And um, I wanted to just at least understand what was going on there because I was like, why I'm seeing all my friends kill it. I sit with The weekend. And he seems to have his whole thing together. And uh, if I, I kind of maybe my best example was that it feels like life is happening to me instead of me happening to it. 
And that was my experience with ADHD. It was that like everything was just happening to me. And then I was like, how did I get here? Why is why am I on stage? Did I want to be on this stage? Did I just say yes to that? And you know what I mean? And it yeah. felt like I had no control. And then um, once I started taking the medication, it was it felt like I was on top of what was going on. And and with this show, I was able to articulate where I wanted to get to to my team. Whereas before, I would just be like, I don't even know. Did I say that yesterday? Or <laughs> do you feel like you? Yeah. I sound feel, insane most of the time. Yeah. No, but, but do you feel like everything kind of ultimately like paced out the way it was meant to be paced out? What with the with my show? Well, or no, oh, just right. even discovering when you yeah. like yeah, for real. Like everything right. kind of happened when it needed to happen. Yeah, yeah. Do you know? I always say, um, "What we are the we are the actors in the movie. We're not the writers of the movie." And I see it that with life. You know, life is writing our stories, and some of us want to rush to be. Uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio overnight and it's like yeah but Leo had to get to a point uh, to to become the, the the lead guy you know um, and so for me I kind of see it that way with my career as well There's, I've had so many moments where I've taken L's or I've been the guy in the background when actually I made the whole thing I remember like even Noah I, I, I did this record Make Me Cry With uh, Noah of course yeah yeah so fucking that was good. one of my favourite records and, and it was so fun like I wrote the record with her and, and I love the way she writes and, and her excitement was just like so so inspiring but at the time I ended up writing a lot of the record and we went to a radio station as a collaborative uh, experience yeah. and uh Everyone was so gassed that she's Miley's sister and she's uh, like one of the Cyruses that it was like literally like, hey, this is Lab who wrote the record. And literally they would, I would put my hand out and they would walk right past my hand to go talk to her. And I was like, cool. Like, and I was, I, I didn't take it personally, but I was like, that's another part of this industry that just is that way. It's like people gravitate towards the easy option, which is like fame, excitement, how can I get something valuable out of this moment? Um, and and I've seen some of those same people come to me now and are like, Euphoria and Labyrinth, you're so amazing. And be like, but the last time you just walked past my hand, like, it's so weird. Why do you do that? <laughs> because they're shallow. That's a character they, in this. Yeah, the, but, but the thing is, I'm also, I've done that. I've been that guy. And, and not even uh, knowingly, like I've, I haven't done it consciously, but... Uh, people gravitate towards things that makes make them feel safe. So it's like, I want to be uh, around fame. I want to be around success. And you find yourself speaking that same language where it's like, there's this guy coming up and he's like, please, can you support me? And I'm so focused on my career and being bigger that I go for the guy that's big enough to help me climb the ladder and not knowing that this kid is actually going to be the next biggest thing. And I, I, I kind of, you know what I mean? I've, huh. I've just done this. I've just run for the, the easy option. And I didn't notice that I've kind of uh, 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 been that same guy, you know? So for me, I've always tried to be aware of that because I know what it, it feels like to be both sides, you know? So I, I have no judgment for the people that are there. But the only thing I would say to them is just be like, be aware of yourself to be able to know when you're being that guy that's like almost the leech trying to get <laughs> and they're everywhere but also bro. awareness is the hardest trait to yeah. acquire bro it's, it, madness. it's either innate or you yeah. have to learn from failure and losing people that are valuable to you yep. yeah yeah 100 yeah, and yeah. not having it is really hard yeah it's it's hard because you uh because you run into like a lot of things that challenge you when you when you're not aware of yourself you're um, problem. You, yeah you become you become everyone you everything you don't want to be when you're not aware of yourself because you're just you'll if you have no standards you'll just be anything in order to to get to a um an experience that's short short-lived you and know people are blind to yeah it and selfish and i was yeah. literally just having this conversation with one of my good friends yesterday yeah. he's like if your intention yeah and your actions are not pure yes. or not well intended yeah even if you acquire success from those actions, yep. it's short-lived success when life is not a fucking sprint. It is yeah. very much a marathon. Yep. And we're playing the long game each and every day. Yeah. So, uh, you know, leeches exist 
all over the place and yeah. most of them are unaware. People get blind to success. They want to be around what is it, what is now. When the reality is like what you're ending up doing is looking over the one thing that is timeless yeah, yeah. to focus on what is fleeting. Yep. But I think it's because that's the language in this industry. So it's, it's quite consistently the, um, uh, everybody believes that you're not valuable unless you have something. And so even if your thing is lived, is, is gained vicariously through, oh, I'm sitting next to Beyonce, so I'm valuable. And I had, I remember meeting a friend over here who's a director and he was like, bro, I was working on this big artist and I came to LA to, to write this movie. I had this idea that is so incredible and I love it and it's so deep to me and so close to my heart. And I wanted to share it with the world whatever way I could. That was my mission. And then I was sitting next to this famous guy and it became important for me to be the famous guy's director, cameraman. And he posted my name online and he made me look famous and my friends were like, oh my God, you killed it. And and that became more important to him than his, his movie dream. that he came to make. And then like he realized it and was like, I've done nothing in LA but be this guy's camera guy. Like and 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 that was my vocal currency. And I was like, that can easily happen here where you just you don't even realize that you're not actually living out the thing that you came to do. You kind of get attached to 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 that feeling of being the uh to being someone that people care about even if it's through someone else you know how do you curate the right people around you because that matters yeah. right when you're making art is the right energy the right people with the right intentions especially when you're trying to block out noise or yeah. nonsense i think blocking out noise and having the right people is down to your intention though you know what i mean like huh? so uh you put out what and you get you back. That's exactly it. So you're going to attract what you are. You're going to attract what you are. So if you're shallow, you're going to attract shallow energy. And so the awareness of yourself is the most important thing. It's like, if I, and that's why, same with my children, if I deal with my ADHD, if I deal with my mental state, I'm going to be a better father to them. I'm going to be a better husband to my missus. So I'm, I'm kind of like, let me deal with my shit. Let me go in the studio and make sure I'm clear so that it's not about anyone but what I'm transmitting. Um, and so when I challenge myself in, okay, are you being a leech here? Like, do you really want to work with this, this artist? Or are you, because your a and or your manager is going to find you more important by being connected with this person, uh, you have to ask yourself those questions. And then you're like, then you're going to get to true art. Then you're going to be like, actually, it's not about anyone, but what I'm trying to say here. And I think it makes your work become... Uh, more layered and more um it becomes more true more than anything emotionally valuable more true that's exactly it. it's just more true and it's like for me getting to the truth is everything for me you gotta listen to labyrinth's music we're gonna put a link in the description below all of the music that labyrinth's made is available on amazon music and obviously ends and begins it's the most recent album you took two songs off the album correct yeah yeah. Uh, lift off. Yeah. And, and Iridium. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a weird word to say. <laughs> I, I, I got really nervous. I'm really glad you said it first. Uh, do you replace them with the other 80 that you have sitting on a hard drive or what? Um, well, you know, the, there is a deluxe album. So <laughs> Target there's so much music. Yeah. <laughs> the Target exclusive. That's too funny. Um, do you know what? It's just because I listened to the record and I was like, this, these, these feel like the record, like just more from a feeling point of view. Um, I, I did some, uh, I felt it out and I was like, okay, I'm going to start, the, the album's literally called Ends and Begins and I was saying at Coachella, um, for me, this is a new beginning. So that's even the name of the album is Labyrinth Ends and Begins. So literally what was is over yep. and now it's something new. Yep. So what is the sonic difference between what we're getting on this album compared to everything else we've heard? It's not about necessarily a sonic difference. It's about... A, a new way of thinking it's like a new it's a it's a growth in terms of everything we've been talking about it's like music with intention a, a, a career with intention like my live show with Coachella was the beginning of that for me where it's like this show is every intention I wanted it to, to be because it wasn't about uh, being the best show at Coachella it was about I really love this stuff and I want to share it with you. That's literally what my focus was in the show. And that's how I want my career to be is I really love this. I want to share it with you. And the other stuff, I don't have any control over, you know? 
and honestly, that doesn't matter. It's about yeah. your intention, and that's yeah. it. Ends and begins. Listen to it. And then I'm going to be like, but it better be the biggest album in the world. No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. I really don't need Do to. you even give a shit about that anymore? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, it's not important, bro. <laughs> but can you only say it and laugh about it because you are elaborate? Because it's funny, bro. It's uh, no, no, for real. Yeah, yeah. But it better make me fun. The thing is, it's, uh, uh, like, I guess uh, people, it's weird because when you haven't achieved uh, uh, like multi platinum records and all that kind of stuff, you kind of you think you need it. You think you need it until you get there, and you're like, actually, do I want to say something or do I want platinum records? And like I said, but life saying- writes a story, not us. So if life writes a story, you don't know where any of your records are going to end up. You don't know if you're going to have a smash. You don't know. So it's like, why not? In the moment, or the, while you have the chance, go write the shit you really want to say. Well, and in the process, you'll get a platinum record or a few. Yep. But that's down to life. That I literally have no control whether this album's going to be platinum or not. But you can listen to it. And, yep. and begins. Listen to it on Amazon Music. You, you guys can choose. <laughs> Did it take a lot of convincing to get Zendaya on the album and on stage, considering she hasn't done music in a while? <laughs> Did it take convincing? Yeah. No, I, I think um, me and Z... We just get on creatively, honestly. Like um, when we were writing, I'm tired, and we wrote uh, the, um, the record we did with Dominic Fike. We it was just like we just literally we just mess with like we were like supporters of what each other does, especially in music. So she was just like, "Lab, I want to be on it," you know. Done. She's incredible. I love Zendaya, honestly. Like she's just a, a insane talent. Like create like I don't you don't see many art like creatives like her. You know, like acting, musician. And like, by the way, been making music lot. for quite some time. I know, I know, I know. She came on our. What, how long did did she come on? Ten oh, years ago. Wow, really? Oh, oh okay, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Oh, we've been. I've been on the radio for sixteen years. Yeah, pretty that's fucking wild, long. bro. That's no, actually it's crazy. D- disgusting. Um, she was here in twenty thirteen. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't have even known her then. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's mad. <laughs> and by the way, twenty thirteen is when "Beneath Your Beautiful" comes out with Emily Sande. <laughs> One of my favorite songs of all That's time. Crazy. I played that on the radio. That's so wild. Um, yeah. There we go. God, Beneath Your Beautiful changed my fucking life. Oh, that's crazy. It, like, that's why I performed that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brother. I remember you re- released it then. So, and so, yeah, that's mad. Changes Full the circle. way I look at love. There we go. Really? There we go. Remar- we're like, oh, so good. Okay, what else are you thinking? That's what, yeah. Sorry. That's one I did with Mike. Mike well, Posner. I love him, man. He also, that's my boy. He is like a longtime friend of the show. Okay. He so gives us time when nobody... He interviewed with us for the first time in 2010, and he yeah. probably has been on the show maybe, I don't know, six times, eight times since. Amazing. Been a lot. Yeah, Amazing. He's fucking incredible. I love I love Mike, honestly. One of the most underrated musicians yeah, of our time. He's been, he's, been a, like, he's been like a big part of my like writing career, and we've written a lot of records together, but and, and just been like mentally like as supportive. Like So you just call Mike, and Mike's like, Lab, come on, man. Do it for the right reason. I'm like, safe. And I needed to hear that. He's always the guy, no matter what, and I've known him a long time, he'll always call you back. Yep. He's fucking That's a Mike. class act. That's Mike, for real. And I agree with that. So gifted. Yeah. Like, I just have, I've He's got goosebumps. skills. Like, yeah. He's got absolute skills. God. What else are you thinking? Well, you guys call him Sia a musical genius, and a lot of people call you that. I'm sure it's a weird yeah. thing to be called. But, like, what does it mean to be a musical genius? I believe that genius, to me, is arriving at the place that is clearly you that's what i think and and uniquely you because i uh i guess like of course you can read out what the word genius means but but um i think it's to be great in a thing that is uh, unique to you and 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 so to me i think uh um i people can call it genius for me it, it, it's it's arriving i think it's like to know yourself when do you think that happened to you um uh, I guess you know I've just always been like uh, I've always kind of known what I wanted to say. It was more about me n- knowing how to be that outside of the studio because, mm-hmm. like, in the studio, I I it's just naturally I just zone out and I'm like I'm just writing. Um, but as soon as it, it's in the music industry, it feels very challenging because it's like, am I supposed to be this way? And it was more about being liked. It was like another part of, mm-hmm. yeah, like. A likability, uh, all of that kind of kid stuff, you know, like um, uh, being appreciated, being validated. And there's a moment where you have to let that go. Mm-hmm. And that's where I feel your true, uh, like, 
mastery or genius can come through. That is... It's why very few are actually geniuses, right? Because not everyone gets there, but I, yeah. you could get there in time. Yeah, I feel like anyone... I, I honestly think... I personally feel like everyone has a gift. Um, and to arrive there, you have to readjust your intention. Like, And so it's like, if I'm trying to become better at music so that I can be better than everyone else... I don't think it's uh, it's not a powerful enough reason for you to create something. Well, you're not actually focused on the thing that you're supposed to be focused on. Like, yeah, you're just like you're not gonna get you're not gonna hit the soul because you're just gonna be like, I'm gonna write a song that's better than Ed Sheeran and <laughs> like I don't know, you know what I mean? And and then if my focus is that, that's that's the energy that's gonna be on the record. So I I'm I'm kind of like how can I, my excitement is like. How can I make this thing that I hear in my head? That's literally my first thought in the studio. It's like, oh, MS20, Pulley 6. What if I did this and added reverb, but reverse the reverb? Like, that's that's my that's my excitement in the studio. Do you only hear it in your head? Do you see things in your head when you're making music? Yeah, yeah. So, like, I could see trees and I can hear what a tree sounds like. Uh, like, I can, hear, uh, I can hear the synth that I'd, would be a tree in my head. I sound, it sounds really weird, but I, cool. yeah, visuals instantly inspire sound for me. When you're like actually creating, like what is going on? Like you're like shouting things out, but what are you actually seeing? What am I seeing? Yeah, in the studio. I can see the sound that I'm making. So it's like, it might, it might be a texture. So every sound has a visual. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it's even textural in my mouth. So like really? a Juno 60 for me has, it's like a rubbery, um um almost like a you know like um those sweets um i've forgotten what they're called but the, it's like a rubbery sweet you give it like laffy taffy it's energy? really soft almost a, a bit like that it's got a bit of that going on um but if it's really soft it's not as f like uh what's it synthetic as the sweet uh. but the texture is definitely that vibe and I can literally like when I'm playing the sounds like doo -boo -doo -doo -boo -boo, I can literally feel it in my mouth. It's so do, weird. Do you feel it while you're performing too, or in, only in the studio? Um, while I'm performing, I black out. Got so it. when I'm performing, um, it's more I feel like an energy coming from up the top into my head, and I'm just like wow. out. I'm like zoned out. You got to listen to Labyrinth's music. <laughs> All of it so is weird, available. <laughs> Amazon Music. <laughs> You're extraordinary, man. <laughs> I respect, bro. I really could talk to you for hours. I know you have a day to get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, f f final well, thought wonderful yeah. to speak to you both, man. Like, really, truly a gift. Final did, thoughts? Did you and Billy build Never Felt So Alone together, or did you write that, and then you're like, this needs Billy's voice on it? Yeah, um, Never Felt So Alone was actually supposed to be on Imagination and the Mis Misfit Kids. Another one? Yep. <laughs> How Another many songs record. did you make for that Crazy. album? I, I made loads. I made, there's, yeah, maybe twice the amount. Um, but yeah, uh, that was going to be an album. I didn't use it because it was too long. Uh, it, uh, it was attached to another song. I didn't use it because it was too long. And then I, uh, Sam ended up using it in the show. And uh, yeah, when I, when I did, when I was like, do you know what? I love this hook so much that it deserves a song sent it to billy and she was like lab i love this record like and she, so she was like i'm jumping on do you feel like the songs you've written for the show are just as much yours as they are the shows um well the ones that it's crazy the ones that really blew up are my songs yeah. they're actually from my album they were licensed to the show like mount so everest mount everest all for us these were like originally my records that like kind of got licensed to the show so it's it's so weird that like People really gravitated to the ones that like uh, um, were my records. Of course, still don't know my name was written for the show. Um, when I R.I.P. was written for the show. So there's a few records that I wrote um, while the show was going on that are still like still like uh, Formula as well. That was actually written for Formula was written for like the title. So it was supposed to be the music that was played every time the show starts. But like, of course, like times have changed. Um, <laughs> And it was just weird, yeah. Like it, it ended up being another record that people really loved. Wow. It's yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so odd, <odd>, right? <laughs> it's wild to see yeah. just like where the records go once you make them. Because yeah, yeah, they yeah. literally can go anywhere. And that's what I'm saying. You have no control. Like I um still don't know my name was literally just a hook. And when <laughs> when the show ended and I said to my manager, I was like, Bro, I think these songs could connect with the fans. And he was like, Bro, you're writing 
m- music for a TV show, just leave it there. Left it. And then everyone was like, I where still don't know my name. I'm trying to get online. I was like, okay, now I've got to write this song. <laughs> so you had to go then build out the rest of the song. Yeah, I wrote just- the song after. I wrote the song much later. So all the verses and all that stuff, I literally wrote it one day in a hotel room with like, I had my man, my day-to-day manager in the, in, the, in the room sitting there while I was recording the lyrics. And then and then I sent it to Mix. <laughs> That's <laughs> again, so weird. again, like further proof that we are just the actors, yep. not the writers of this yep. movie. And the more you get out of the way, is the more you can see the story being told. Like you literally, if you just literally stand back and watch your life happen, uh, of course you've got to do some work. <laughs> you know, this one's just like I just sat there, like what Lab said, and nothing happened. And fifteen years flew by. <laughs> I haven't moved. <laughs> No, no, but yeah, you, you're literally just partaking in your experience. Listen to this man. Music and words. Look in the description below. <laughs> there you good? Go. Yeah. Final yeah. thoughts? <laughs> no. You have one more? Have you started writing for season three yet? Or any of the al- are any of the songs on this album, were, were they songs you held over from writing for Euphoria, or did they all come specifically for this album? Uh, oh, what, from this album? Yeah. It ends and begins. Yeah, some of the songs I actually played for season two. Um, it just didn't make it. Some of the songs, um, like, they were going to be in season two. Um, but just with the music, there was so much music that we, it just didn't end up happening. It was a really, this this season was, uh, season two was crazy. It was really difficult. There was so much shit going on. So um, um, I'm kind of happy it's just stayed on the record. Like, I, I, I love these records as they are. And at what point in season three will you come into the process? Um, I don't know. I think I'm going to go see Sam like in a few days. So I'll know then. <laughs> Very cool. You got a yeah. lot of songs to choose from. <laughs> yeah, I'll play him the album and yeah. be like, so bro, take your pick. <laughs> well, th- we've got 90, <laughs> uh, 90 yeah, or 80 something <laughs> records. Yeah, so we'll see. <laughs> well, listen uh, to the ones that made the album. Ends and Begins. We're going to put a link in the description below and all of Labyrinth's music, including LSD and the whole thing, available on Amazon Music. I really can't thank you enough for your time and energy today and your words. Uh, I appreciate you, man. You're Thanks for having incredible. me. Uh, I, I I appreciate that, man. So are you guys? You guys' vibe is amazing, and your and your studio is sick, by the way. Thank you. Like real recognizes real, and I really appreciate that. Appreciate uh, you. I appreciate, I appreciate you saying about the studio because we're moving soon. And I'm like, I think I like this one. Yeah, man, it's a good it's a good spot. But I'm sure. Well, if you guys got the same taste, then you'll just bring it there, right? Thank you very much. Yes. yes. I mean, yeah. we will send a clip of this to Andy Jassy and Jeff Bezos, but yeah. you know, it's fine. It's totally okay. <laughs> Labyrinth, it. everybody. Right, bro. <laughs>